test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. 
Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, okay? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. Uh, yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be OK. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health, or unemployed, or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. OK. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax, or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those, somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use, a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't, actually. Now, I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. OK, first question. 
it's still a branch of the popular bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm. And when is it open, Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's... Just weekdays, I'm afraid. Mm. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9.30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main center building, is it? Next to the travel agency. That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh. And one last thing on this. Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No, there's nothing mentioned here. Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance, you know. It may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial center is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the center, Go along Market Street past the post office and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre. Mm. Then you take the first right. You'll see an internet cafe on the other side and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre and go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street. Mm. There you turn right again and carry on up as far as the next junction where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one, uh, the National Bank? You can go either way from the center, really. Up West Street or Bridge Street and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two friends planning an event. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair, or something like that, would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. OK, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents and so on. Then, we do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. That's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many. Otherwise, the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? OK. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative. Say, one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, how much money it takes to keep the place running and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar, too. He can rally lots of support. And Mr Sims, our Member of Parliament. He is very busy, but I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. 
Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith. The journalist? Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind, Freddie Smith and... Oh, yes, Mr Gates. Mr Gates. Do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fate. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr Perkins, Mr Sims, that journalist... Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him. And the vicar and Mr Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about 800 years, from 750 BC to 43 AD. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel-thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, Someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts or in bell-shaped pits two to three metres deep. Some 4,500 of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family, not only with heavy farm labour, in the case of the cattle, such as the ploughing of crop fields, 
but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artefacts. Horses were used for pulling two or four wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth, and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained twenty-four hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand from the local clay and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal and was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. My mind is